Once upon a time, AT&T was a corporate juggernaut. In fact, they controlled 80 to 85% of the US telephone market. And they were so big and so powerful that the federal government ordered that they be split into seven smaller regional companies. This didn't really change much though, as many of these new regional companies just ended up joining forces and creating a duopoly known as Verizon and AT&T. As a result, not much has actually changed about AT&T's position within the market. They still dominate broadband internet, wireless connections, and even fiber internet. But when we take a closer look at the company's financials and stock price, it's not all that great. Just a few quarters ago, they had $180 billion worth of debt. They have paid this down a lot due to rising interest rates, but they still have $120 billion worth of debt. Unfortunately, it's not just their debt that's been going down either. To accomplish this, they've had to sell off a crap ton of their assets. At the beginning of 2022, they had $577 billion worth of assets. But today, their total asset stands at $426 billion or $150 billion less. And the market downturn hasn't made this any easier for them. AT&T's revenue has fallen from $183 billion to $155 billion. Similarly, their net income has stayed identical for 13 years now at about $20 billion. Likely the biggest red flag for AT&T, however, is their stock price, which at this point peaked 23 years ago. AT&T is literally at the same stock price that it was at way back in 1995. And that's not even accounting for inflation. Since 1995, the value of the dollar has nearly halved, meaning that AT&T stock is basically down 50% in the past 28 years. Now, it should be noted that AT&T does pay a strong dividend of 6%. But other than that, they've really got nothing going for them. Yet, no one wants to take on this company, and they remain just as powerful and monopolistic as ever. So, how is AT&T yet to be disrupted? To understand why no one wants to take on AT&T, we first have to understand how the company got so big in the first place. And this story dates all the way back to 1875 to a man that you're probably familiar with, Alexander Graham Bell. If you're not familiar with this guy, he's the dude who invented the telephone. And like any good inventor, Graham Bell moved to monetize his invention by connecting the world. To do this, he created a company called the Bell Telephone Company with two of his buddies, Thomas Watson and Gardner Green Hubbard, right after he invented the telephone. The telephone was basically an instant success, and this is not really surprising. At first, you couldn't make calls from New York to California, but just being able to make calls within NYC alone was insane. You no longer had to send a postcard or travel 30 or 45 minutes just to pass a message. Instead, you could just telephone the person from the comfort of your home or office. For the first few decades, the Bell Company was just a conglomeration of dozens of smaller networks spread across the US. But at the turn of the century, the Bell Company evolved into something much bigger, thanks to a new invention called loaded coils that could carry signals across much longer distances. Suddenly, all of the smaller networks across the US could start connecting with each other to form one ginormous network. And Bell Telephone would change their name to AT&T or American Telephone and Telegraph to reflect this new national focus. This was by no means an easy feat though, as it took them another 15 years to actually make this vision a reality. But eventually, in January of 1915, Alexander Graham Bell would be able to make a ceremonious call from NYC to his assistant, Watson, in San Francisco. Graham Bell would repeat the first words that he ever said through a telephone. Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. And Watson would reply, it will take me five days to get there now. As you would guess, the crowds on both sides went absolutely wild. The mayors of the two cities would go on to talk and even the president, Woodrow Wilson, would put in a few words. We should note that this service was insanely expensive, coming in at $20.70 for the first three minutes, followed by $6.75 for each additional minute. I mean, that's expensive even in 2023 dollars. But if we adjust for inflation, 
we get $610 for the first 3 minutes, followed by $200 per minute after that. Obviously, the average person could not afford this, but for rich businessmen, this was an invaluable service. You were literally able to cut down on 10 days worth of back and forth travel just to communicate, but not everyone was so happy. If AT&T was able to connect California and New York, that meant that they also owned everything in between, and regulators weren't exactly happy with that. They had let this slide for quite some time as they were busy cracking down on Standard Oil. But after the breakup of Standard Oil in 1911, regulators would shift their entire focus onto AT&T. The first of the government crackdowns came in 1913 with something called the Kingsbury Commitment. At the time, AT&T not only controlled the entire network, but they also produced the only viable telephone. Fortunately for AT&T, the government wasn't looking to destroy the entire company with this settlement. They simply wanted to encourage competition within both the network space and the telephone space, and they would soon come to a pretty favorable settlement consisting of three stipulations. First, AT&T had to allow other companies to use their long-distance network for commercial purposes. Second, AT&T had to spin off their telephone company into a separate company called Western Electric. And at three, AT&T was not allowed to purchase any other company without the government's approval. The government hoped that the new companies would jump onto this opportunity, but no one did for the next 40 years. And honestly, this isn't even AT&T's fault. Even if AT&T themselves truly encouraged competition, no one is going to compete against them simply because it's not a very appealing business. Here's the thing, as an entrepreneur during this time period, you could either produce World War II materials, jump onto the automotive trend, or create a retail giant. Or you could try to build out a national network and take on AT&T. The problem isn't that AT&T is a monopoly. The problem is that the capital, time, and effort required to build a network of that scale simply isn't worth it when there are so many better opportunities. And this is still very much true to this day. I mean, would you rather build a 6G company and try to take on AT&T, or would you rather build a social media app and try to take on Facebook? While your odds of success are super low with both endeavors, your odds of success in social media are likely magnitudes higher than your odds in telecommunications. The government eventually came to this same realization, and they would become even more aggressive with their crackdowns. In 1949, the government would sue AT&T once again, and this lawsuit would be dragged on for seven years. Eventually, they would come to a new settlement with three more stipulations. First, AT&T had to sell Western Electric to a third party. Second, AT&T was barred from expanding their business outside of connecting telephone calls. And finally, AT&T had to license their patents to potential competitors. But due to all the reasons that we just discussed, no one still wanted to get into the telecommunications space. All of this eventually culminated into a boiling point in 1982 when regulators ordered that AT&T be split up into seven different companies. It seems like the government was pretty confident in this move. In fact, they were so confident that they would even remove the stipulations of the 1956 agreement, meaning that the new smaller companies could expand into new lines of business. Ironically though, this ended up backfiring big time as this simply allowed AT&T to expand into broadband internet and wireless communications, the two sectors that have allowed them to survive. Through all of this, the one thing that becomes extraordinarily clear is that you can't kill monopolies simply using regulation or even breakups. The only way to kill monopolies is through revolutionary innovation. Take Standard Oil for example. They were literally broken up over a hundred years ago, yet they're still a top 10 company worth $450 billion in the form of Exxon. The reason for this is that people's demand for oil never changed. In fact, it only went up. The same thing could be said about AT&T for much of the 1900s. The government tried everything they could to stop AT&T other than straight up shutting down the company. But none of this addressed the insatiable demand for communications. Something that did address this demand, however, was the internet and cell phones. But somehow, the government managed to break up AT&T at the perfect time 
for them to switch to supporting the internet and cell phones. If the government hadn't done that, AT&T would have gotten destroyed given that landline popularity has plummeted from 80% to 29% within the past 14 years. But instead, AT&T has been able to build a new life with new sectors. At this point, even money can't disrupt AT&T. And the best example of this is Google's attempt to take on AT&T. About 10 years ago, Google tried to take on the broadband internet market by introducing Google Fiber. At the time, most broadband connections offered 10, maybe 20 Mbps per second max. Meanwhile, Google was willing to offer 1000 Mbps or 1 Gbps for relatively affordable prices. At first, Google expanded to several cities very quickly, but it didn't take them long to realize that they had bitten off more than they could chew. You see, as soon as Google started introducing fiber, AT&T hit back harder than they could ever imagine. AT&T turned around and spent $140 billion on a nationwide rollout of fiber. And today, they offer even better speeds than Google, coming in at up to 5 gigabits per second. Now, if Google really wanted it, they could go all in on fiber and try to take on AT&T. But for what? Given that they would have to build from scratch, it would cost them $200 or $250 billion. Even if a bunch of people adopted this service and Google Fiber grew to be as large as the entire company of AT&T, it would still just be a $130 billion business. Even if it became a $200 or $300 billion business, it simply isn't worth it. When you're investing $200 to $250 billion, you're expecting trillions in return, not hundreds of billions. Not to mention, it's not even an easy to manage simple business either. You literally have to deal with managing hundreds of billions of dollars worth of infrastructure just to make 10% margins. Google had a very similar realization with their wireless project Google Fi as well. And if a company as powerful and as rich as Google can take on AT&T, no one can. In the end, AT&T is one of those super weird businesses that's worth owning if it already exists, but not worth building. At this point, the only way that this company gets taken down is if another communications revolution comes around and the company doesn't pivot. Now, of course, maybe Verizon can slowly chip away at their market share and slowly drive them to unprofitability. But that doesn't really mean much given that Verizon is also a product of the original AT&T. With all of that being said though, we do have to give AT&T prompts. Unlike the leading tech companies that are constantly trying to grow and reach the next magnitude, AT&T has been very comfortable with where they are. They know their lane and they know it very well, and they don't care about exploring other lanes. Of course, they have made some growth moves in the past like buying a direct TV. But for the most part, they just stick to what they're good at and pay out as high dividends as they can. That's what they've been doing for the past 140 years, and that's what they're gonna do moving forward. And ain't no one gonna do anything about it. But that's just what I think. Are you happy with your internet provider? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you wish more companies stopped chasing endless growth. And of course, consider checking out our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.